just about ready to set. It is called the Gray, one of the holiest days of the year, probably the holiest day next to Shabbat. We are here to release ourselves from the vows that we will be making, to seek forgiveness from God, to seek forgiveness from each other on this beautiful, beautiful evening. Kol Nidre is a, it's hard to call it a prayer, it's more of a legal formula. It releases us from vows that we have taken. Torah it teaches us that if you swear to God anything, you have to carry it out. Kol Nidre removes that onus from us, and uh, depending on which version you read, forgives us from last year's, or three, forgives us for this year's. The only thing Yom Kippur does not forgive are the sins against each other, right? So we, we don't, if we have gripes, if we have, what's it, beef? If we have beef, <laughs> beef with each other. Um, what if, what if, we don't care? if you have soy with each other, <laughs> then Yom Kippur does not atone for that until you work your, your soy or your beef out with the others. But this evening, we're going to assume that we are all here, all forgiven by each other, and waiting on God to forgive us for our our missteps. And so, all right, we're going to have the candle lighting then. So those for candle lighting, please come forward. As we get ready for Kol Nidre, let's read responsibly on page 14. Page 14, we'll read responsibly. Yom Kippur, the Jewish people's festival of the soul, and Kol Nidre, its sacred portal, a night of deep emotions, a night as the psalmist wrote, to rejoice with trembling. We tremble at the melody, music of spiritual amazement. It fills us with awe as we stand before God and Torah. We tremble, for tonight we confess our flaws, admit our imperfection, and acknowledge a power far beyond our understanding. We tremble, for we find that our ideals are far greater than our ability. Our promises surpass our might. We tremble because we are mortal. We rejoice in our gratitude for life. As I said, Kol Nidre is a legal formula, and it uh, allows us to pray with sinners as well. It gives us all permission to be here this evening. So we're going to need some witnesses, and we, on that we call the Sifrei Torah. We call on the Torahs to stand as our eternal witnesses. And so we have people coming up to open the ark and people coming up to hold the Sifrei Torah.
given the entire community of Israel and the stranger who lives in their midst for all have gone astray in error. Moses prayed to God, as you have been faithful to this people ever since Egypt, please forgive their failings now in keeping with your boundless love. the office closing, please remain standing for the Baruch Hu. Page 24, page 24. Blessed are you, Adonai, your great name fills the universe with majestic might. Your word creates twilight and dust, as your wisdom opens the gates of night. Your discernment separates the changing seasons and causes the passage of time. The stars arrayed, arrayed across the sky reveal your design. You roll out the cycle of darkness and light, shaping day and night. You sweep away day and carry the world into nightfall setting day apart from nighttime. You are God of all we can perceive, all and all that is beyond our perception. Living eternal God, be our sovereign at the end of time. <laughs> Six and read with me a Habat Olam in English. <laughs> 
love beyond all space and time. Your love is called to your people Israel. We receive it in your teaching, your gift of Torah, sacred obligations, discipline, and law. So let us speak these teachings when we lay down and rise up, and find joy forever in your Torah and Mitzvah. They are the very essence of our life, ours to honor and study all our days, and we never lose to be unworthy of your love. Turn with me to pages 34 and 35 as we read together in English the two, uh, the second paragraph of the Shema. If indeed you obey my commandments, which I instruct you this day, loving Adonai your God, serving God with all your heart and soul, I will grant rain to you, land, season, the early rain, the late, and you will gather in your new grain and wine and oil, and I will provide grassland for your cattle. Thus you will eat and be satisfied. Be careful not to be lured away to serve other gods, bowing down to them. Then the anger of Adonai will flare up against you, for God will hold back the sky so that there will be no rain, and the ground will not yield its crops, and you will soon perish from the good land that Adonai is giving you. Therefore, place these, my words, upon your heart, upon your very being. Bind them as a sign upon your hand, let them be a symbol before your eyes. Teach them to your children. Speak of them in your home and on your way. When you fly down and when you rise up, inscribe them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates, so that your days and the days of your children may increase upon the land that Adonai swore to give to your ancestors for as long as the heavens are over the earth. <laughs> Uh, 
page 38, let's read these paragraphs responsibly. Truth and faith. Our sovereign saves us from tyranny, redeems us from its violence through countless wonders, from its, brutal from its brutality through great feats beyond measure. We are the real people of God, the of life, not the of the Age 40. Bless our sleep with peace, Adonai, and awaken us to the life when we rise. With some flower sublime, spread over us the shelter of shalom, and through your wisdom restore us, make us whole. Let your name proclaim your presence in our lives, be our shield, make us stronger than the enemies we face, illness and war, famine and sorrow, and stronger than the enemies in our hearts. You are the monarch of grace, the sovereign of compassion. You are the one who cares for us and sets us free. Watch over us, you go forth life. Watch over us that we may come home in peace now until the end of time.
or on the top of page 45, the verse from Leviticus that celebrates the idea of Yom Kippur, a day that atonement shall be made for us. This verse proclaims the central purpose of this sacred occasion, purification and forgiveness. Thank you. 
Let's read together in, on page 56 in the English. And so, in your holiness, give the righteous the gifts of a vision bright with joy, a world where evil has no voice, and the rule of malevolence fades like wisps of smoke, so that people everywhere will celebrate the sun of sight and arrogance gone on in the earth. <laughs> chose us with love to be messengers of these folks, and through us you have made known your aspirations. We bring the sacred name upon our calling. Let's read together in the English. Our God, the God of the generations before us, may a memory of us ascend and come before you. May it be heard and seen by you, winning your favor and reaching your awareness, together with the memory of our ancestors, and the memory of your sacred city, Jerusalem, and the memory of your people, the family of Israel. May we be remembered for safety, well-being, and favor, for love and compassion, for life and on this day of atonement. Eternal our God, remember us. Be mindful of us. Redeem us for a life of goodness and blessing. Top of page 66. God of our forebears, who pardon our failings on this day of atonement, erase our misdeeds, see beyond our defiance. For Isaiah said in your name, it is I, I alone, who wipe away your defiant acts. This is my essence. I shall pay no heed to your errors. And the prophet said, 
As a cloud fades away, as mist dissolves into air, so you are wrong, the mistakes shall be gone. I will wipe them away. Come back to me that I may redeem you. And you said to Moses, for on this day of atonement shall be made for you to purify you from all your wrongs, and pure you shall be in the presence of other God, who is ours and God of our fathers and mothers, lead us to holiness through your mitzvot, and may each of us find a portion of Torah that is ours. You bestow such goodness. Teach us to be satisfied and to know the joy of your salvation. You are blessed, Adonai, sovereign who forgives in our failings and pardons the failings of your people, the house of Israel. You banish our guilt from year to year. You reign in majesty over all the earth. You sanctify the people of Israel in the day of atonement. Thank you. 
here on page 74. And let's read responsibly in the middle of the page. God, who is ours, God of all generations, to you we are grateful forever. We thank you and tell the tale of your praise, your power in our lives, your caring for our souls, the constant miracle of your kindness. Let's continue in the middle of page 76. And for all these gifts, God of majesty, may your name come to be blessed and praised. Our gratitude, a daily offering until the end of time. And may all life resound with gratitude and faith. In praise of your name, God, you free us and strengthen us. responsibly in English. Peace, profound and lasting, all embracing. Peace, let this be your gift to Israel, your people. May your goodness, author of peace, bless us and all people every season, every hour with the peace that is yours to give.
on the high holiday, especially on Yom Kippur, we have the Zui Zuta, I'm sorry, the Yui Zuta, which is the small confession, and then we have the Yui Rava, which is the great confession. Both of them focus on our sins. Moshe Ben Ezra, a great commentator from the Middle Ages, says, No sin is so light that it may be overlooked. No sin is so heavy that it may not be repented of. Our confession on Yom Kippur is both public and private. Publicly, we recite the same lists. No one is free from sin, must have uh, done something wrong. We confess in private our sins to God as well, because no intermediary stands between us and God when we seek absolution and forgiveness. As we enter into the Bidui cycle, the cycle of confession, I'll ask that we all please rise. Our God and God of all generations, may our prayers reach your presence, and when we turn to you, do not be indifferent. Adonai, we are arrogant and stubborn, claiming to be blameless and free of sin. In truth, we have stumbled and strayed. We have done wrong. Ay, 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 ay. and the secrets of the human heart. You know and understand us, for you examine our inner lives. Nothing is concealed from you, nothing hidden from your sight. Eternal One, our God and God of our ancestors, 
we pray that this be your will. Forgive all our wrongs. Pardon us of every act of injustice. Help us atone for all our moral failures. Talk of page 86, the Dewey drop up. Please read with me in the second paragraph. The ways we have wronged you by hardening our hearts and harm we have caused in your world through careless speech. The ways we have wronged you through lies and deceit and harm we have caused in your world through gossip and rumor. The ways we have wronged you by judging others unfairly and harm we have caused in your world through disrespect to parents and teachers. The ways we have wronged you through insincere apologies and harm we have caused your world by mistreating a friend or neighbor. The ways we have wronged you through violence and abuse and harm we have caused in your world through dishonesty in business. <laughs> slanderous tongue, and harm we have caused in your world through a selfish or petty spirit.
Take us back, Adonai, let us come back to you, renew our days as in the past. Hear our words, Adonai, understand our unspoken thoughts. May the speech of our mouth and our hearts quiet prayer be acceptable to you, Adonai, our rock and our redeemer. <laughs> Cast us away from your presence and cut us off from your Holy Spirit. Do not cast us away when we are old and our strength diminishes. Do not forsake us. Do not forsake us, Adonai. Be not far from us, our God. <laughs> Thank you. 
forgive their failings now in keeping with your boundless love. And God responded, I forgive as you have asked. <laughs> Consider the clay in the potter's hand, stretched and rolled as the artist desires, so are we in your hand, our loving protector. Consider the stone in the mason's hand, broken or kept whole as the stone cutter sees fit, so are we in your hand, creator of life and death. Consider the iron in the welder's hand, held to the flame or removed at will, so are we in your hand, provider for the poor and afflicted. Consider the helm in the seafarer's hand, steering or drifting as the sailor wills it. And so are, so are we in your hand, our God of goodness and forgiveness. Consider the, cla the glass in the glazier's hand, rounded and melted as the artist desires. So are we in your hand, the one who pardons our errors and our wrongdoing. Page 105, please rise. Eternal God, you revealed to Moses your 13 attributes of mercy. They exist in the world through our awareness. They transform the world through our actions. We speak them now as prayer and aspiration. <laughs> Oh, God. 
We are moving ahead to Avinu Malkeinu. The ark will be open. We are on page 114. 114. Maybe seated.
there's one truth about me. One thing that can be written on my tombstone is that I love to read. And that I'm not perfect. Okay, so there were two things about me and two things that could be written on my tombstone. I love to read and I make mistakes. But you know what? You all share at least one of these traits with me. Our one truth is that no one here is perfect. We may try, but we won't ever be. Nevertheless, we all try. We try not to make mistakes. We try to be perfect so that everyone will like us and accept us. But whence comes this idea that we must be perfect to be worthy of love and acceptance? Do we get it from our parents? who set lofty goals for us, always wanting us to do better and to make the most of ourselves? Do we get it from our teachers and coaches, telling us over and over that we did wrong instead of praising us for what we got right? Did we get it from rabbis and religious school teachers who pounded into us the seriousness of our moral and ritual failings? Do we perhaps get it from outside influences, media, and entertainment. From whence do we get this idea that to be worthy of love, we must be perfect? To be honest with you, attaining perfection is a terrible burden. It wears us out. It makes us feel guilty. It defeats us. Somewhere along the line, things change. No longer is it, good, is it enough to be good at what you do. You must be the best. It's not enough to be respected because you are competent. You need to be number one. Whatever contribution you make, it must be outstanding. We all know someone, perhaps it's each of us, who burns out, self-destructs, or runs themselves into the ground in the quest to become the greatest. But perfection is not what makes us lovable. In our effort to be perfect, we become stubborn and defensive. We start insisting the problem is someone else. We deflect every criticism, rationalize every shortcoming. We all know people who insist that they are perfect. But do we like them? Do we really have to be perfect to be loved? If people knew us as we truly are, would they not love us? One of the most liberating discoveries we can make in life is to find out that we are less than perfect and that we are still loved. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that our shortcomings and mistakes and sins don't matter. They matter a lot but they shouldn't be enough to shatter our relationship with God or with those around us. After all, today is Yom Kippur, and we are atoning for things we have done and things we have left undone. I'm telling you that we can say, I may be wrong, and people will still like us. I'm telling you that we can say, I'll try to help, but I can't solve your problems, and they will still love us. We can say to colleagues, I made a mistake and I need your help, and guess what? They won't reject you. You can say to others, I don't know, and not lose face. In fact, you may find that even it even opens some new doors of communication. We make a terrible mistake when we think that love means that people admire our perfection. It's just not the case. In fact, loving someone means that we look at them and accept them as they are and for who they are. We like to say that love is blind. I don't think that's the case at all. Love means that you look at the person with all their flaws and yours and love them anyway. If you love, you understand the imperfections. Of all the lessons found in the Torah, and the rest of the Bible for that matter, this is probably the most comforting. We find many, many characters with imperfections. 
Some have huge flaws, and God still loves them. We have Abraham, who sends one son to die in the wilderness, and then takes the other to offer as a sacrifice to God. There's Yitzchak, who helps to set up a very dangerous rivalry between his sons. There's Yaakov, who loves son, one son so much that it sends the other 11 into a jealous rage. And then we have King David. What can we say about the king who commits adultery and then sends that husband to his death? Yet despite these flaws, all of these characters still have a relationship with God and they help to carry the tradition. But our list doesn't stop there. Most of the cast of characters in our Tanakh, the entire Bible failed. Moshe repeatedly fails. The major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and, his, and uh, Elijah, they fail in their lives as well. In fact, now this is going to be a little bit of heresy, so we're all friends, and I'll trust you to keep it here. Even God fails. God creates the world, puts it in our hands. We mess it up. God destroys it and starts over with Noah. Noah gets drunk and his descendants fill the world again with violence. God starts over again with Abraham and us and is waiting to see how we fare. Because of their flaws, we can understand these characters. Intellectually, we understand them as being imperfect. But can we honor them? Can we love them? Can we forgive them? The Torah gives us the answer. At the end of the story of Abraham, the Torah tells us that, or shows us one of the most touching and beautiful scenes in the entire Bible. We read, and Abraham breathed his last, dying at a ripe old age, old and contented, and he was gathered to his kin. His sons, Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah. Both sons returned to bury their father. Both sons, traumatized beyond belief in their youth, nevertheless come to bury their father with love and respect. I've often wondered why they returned. What made them come home again? I'd like to think it was because they forgot, they forgave their father. They saw his flaws, recognized his mistakes, and found it in their hearts to forgive him. Abraham, the father of our people, made mistakes. And we make mistakes. How many people do we know who are constantly driven to fulfill some parental expectation? An expectation voiced years and years ago. And how many feel like failures, no matter what they did accomplish, because those expectations of their parents were never realistic. No matter how hard they work, no matter what successes they have, it was never enough. We like to joke about Jewish guilt, especially the guilt put on us by my, my I mean, our mothers. We laugh about it, but there is a dark underbelly to it. And its name, disappointment. There are so many people burdened by the feeling that they've disappointed their parents. There are so many people still arguing with parents, longing for their approval. In some cases, the parents are still with them. In other cases, the parents are dead 5, 10, 20, 30 years. And yet the son is still waiting to hear his father say, you did well. And yet the daughter is waiting to hear her mother say, you're a good girl. For many of these people are filled with anger. They are angry with their parents for placing huge, impossible expectations on their shoulders. They are angry with their parents for not showing affection and love. And these people are angry with everyone around them. All of this anger because of a few words left unspoken. I love you, whatever you do. I love you, whoever you become. 
So on this Yom Kippur, can we forgive them, our parents, for being like us, flawed and imperfect? Can we recognize that their expectations for us reflected their own fears? Maybe dad needed your success to cover his own fear of failure. Maybe mom was afraid to let go because of her, of her own loneliness. Can we forgive them on this Yom Kippur? We need to forgive our parents because one day, many of us wake up and find that we have become parents. Our roles are suddenly reversed. We know love is complex, but the complexity of parental love is off the charts. Parental love is not easy to understand. Parents want children to succeed, but some expect the children to be the successes they never were. Parents sometimes want the children to feel, fulfill their own unfulfilled dreams, to be the doctor, the lawyer, or the millionaire. And when they don't, when they turn out to be people, flawed, imperfect, impulsive, people just like us, what happens? Are they angry? Do they sacrifice their children, cut them down, and cut them off? Or perhaps we teach our children to think for themselves. And when they do, we get upset and angry. We get angry because the decisions they make might not be the ones, may not be the ones we want them to make. So this Yom Kippurim, can you forgive your children? Can you forgive them for being human, just like you? Will you love them for who they are? not who you dreamed they would be. Listen to our tradition. Kol Nidre, the Esare, the Charame. The promises and the expectations, the standards to which you have held your children, they are dissolved and released. They are forgiven for being no more like us than we wanted them to be. They are forgiven for leading their own lives instead of the lives we had designed for them. They are forgiven. But what about the people who are not our parents or our children? What about our friends? Can we forgive those around us? Can we forgive them for being human, for having flaws and imperfections? Can we give, forgive them for not living up to the expectations we have set upon them? Can we forgive our friends? for being just like us, flawed, anxious, imperfect people who are trying to do their very best. I think we can. I think we can forgive those who are just like us, flawed and human, but also created in the image of God. Our tradition teaches that before we can come before God to ask for forgiveness, we must first ask forgiveness from others and forgive those who have hurt us. But sometimes, most of the time, we forget to seek forgiveness from the most important person. We often neglect to forgive ourselves. So I ask, can we forgive ourselves? Can we forgive ourselves for not being honest about who we really are? Can we forgive ourselves for carrying unrealistic, unrealistic expectations and burdens? Can we forgive ourselves for being human? I think we can. You must realize that you are a good person, even though you sometimes fail. You must realize the failure and the mistakes are not the end, but are actually new opportunities for growth. Once you liberate yourself from the idea that you have to be perfect at every move, then, and only then, can you forgive others and yourself. Listen to our tradition. Kol Nidre, the Es Are, the Harame. The promises we made to ourselves, the vows, the goals, the expectations, the plans that fell through, the objectives.
objectives unreached. They're dissolved. Let them go. God says, you are forgiven as you have asked. Kol Nidre begins this process, but it continues throughout the day and hopefully throughout the rest of the year. We need to work to convince ourselves that we do not have to be perfect to be loved. We recite Ashamnu ten times during Yom Kippur. Ten times we will repeat our confession, our God and God of our ancestors, we are neither so insolent nor so obstinate as to claim in your presence that we are righteous without sin. For we, like our ancestors who came before us, like everyone else, have sinned. So why do we cite these words so many, why do we recite these words so many times? It's not for God's sake. God already knows and understands that we are not perfect. And God still loves us. We say the words to convince ourselves that we are not perfect. We have to stop denying and defending ourselves. We have to stop making excuses. We have to admit that we make mistakes. We have to admit that we hurt people. We have to admit all of our sins, all of our shortcomings. But besides Despite that, we need to realize that we are still worthy of being loved by God, by others, by ourselves. And sometime during this long day, usually when we least expect it, something happens. Instead of feeling embarrassed or put down, we feel relieved. We realize that yes, we are human, just like everyone else who was born before us and who will be born after us. And when we realize it's okay, Yom Kippur is suddenly over. Our ancient ancestors ended Yom Kippur not by running out to bake the, break the fast with bagels and locks. They did something different. After the Kohen Gadol declared the people pure, there came a moment, one unique moment, when he pronounced the most holy name of God. At that moment, the people would fall on their faces and cry out, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Leolam Va'ed. They would then rise and give a great cheer, and they would dance. Overcome with the sense of being released, of being purified, of being renewed, of being reborn, they danced. They celebrated the new year and their new life. I began this talk with tombstones, and I'll end, them, end with them. When I visit the cemetery, I always notice piles of stones on the markers. These are left by parents and children, brothers and sisters, friends and lovers, as reminders that we have been there. We haven't forgotten those who left this life before us. But I often wonder, when I see these stones we leave behind, are there also stones that we leave sitting on our hearts? Again, listen to our tradition. This time from Kohelet the book of Ecclesiastes. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to reap, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time for weeping and a time for laughing, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to gather stones, time to cast stones away. Today is the time to let the stones go. Now is the, now is the time to let go of all the expectations. Now is the time to let go of the anger and the frustration. Now is the time to let them go and embrace forgiveness. Forgiveness for others. Forgiveness from others. Forgiveness 
for ourselves. Now, right now, is the time to let the stones we carry go. Now is the time to be reborn and renewed. Gamar Hatamat Toba. We're going to begin closing out our service. Although we're just getting warmed up here, we should stay here all night. Um, get a head start on the morning. We're going to continue on page 116. We're going to have an ARC opening, as well as Elenu. And I'll ask that everyone, please, if you're able, rise. Let's read together in English. And so, Adonai, our God, we look to you, hoping soon to behold the splendor of your power revealed, a world free of idolatry and false gods, a world growing more perfect through divine governance, a world in which all human beings may know your name, while those who do evil turn toward you.
seated. Our thoughts turn to loved ones whom death has taken from us in recent days and those who died at this season in years past. And our hearts open as well to the wider circle of loss in our community and wherever grief touches the human family. May their memories be a blessing in this new year and always. Mourner's Cottage is found on page 122. Yitzkadal, Yitzkadash, Shemek Rabbah, Belmad, Yibrach, Rutek, Yamlik, Machute, Bechayehod, Yomehod, Bechayeh, O Beit Yisrael, Ba'agalah, Bizman, Tari, Yibru, Amen. Yehe, Shemek Rabbah, Korach, Yalam, Ome, Amaya, Yit Barach, Yish Tabah, Yit Ba'ar, Yit Romam, Yit Naseh. The Yitadar, the Yitalad, the Yitalah, the Sheikh, the Shah, the Rehu, the Elam, the Elam, the Kob, your Hata, the Shirata, the Kush, the Hata, the Nechamata, the Miram, the Elma, the Ru, Amen. Yehe, Shlama, Rabba, Min Shemaya, the Chaim, Aleinu, the El Ko Yisrael, the Ru, Amen. O Se Shalom, in Roma, who Yase Shalom. Aleinu v'alcho Yisrael, v'alcho Yoshei Tevel, v'imru, Amen. Seated. Well, friends, unless you do want to hang out uh, for the rest of the night, uh, we are almost at page 126, where you'll find Adon Olam. A couple of quick, quick announcements. Services begin tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. That's 10 a.m., and they will go until they go, until we're done. And then we'll come back in the afternoon for a little bit of afternoon study on Yom Kippur, traditional um, to study a text on Yom Kippur. And I have one of my favorite Hasidic texts for tomorrow, and that's at 2.30. And then around 3.45-ish, and I say ish because it will be ish, um, we'll have the afternoon service. And then uh, 5.45-ish for Yisker led by Rabbi Butcher. And when I say ish, I'm not saying like 545 and it's going to be like 8. Um, it might be 545, it might be 550, it'll be 535. I don't know when the good rabbi comes and he's ready to go. Um, but uh, the, the Yeki in me, the German Jew in me, wants to say all of these times are written in stone and do not be late. Can but I, I can't do that because the gates have yet to close. So two thir uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning for Shacharit, 2.30 for study, 3.45 for the Mintha afternoon service, 5.45 for Yisker, and, uh, which will be immediately followed by Ne'ilah. And so that is our day tomorrow. Um, look forward to seeing you all. Hope that you have a Gemar Hatimat Tovah, uh, that you are all written in the Book of Life, that you have a meaningful fast, those of you who are fasting. And we'll see you here tomorrow. We'll close out page 126. I don't alarm, and I just want to say, to Beth, to Johan and our choir um, for leading us in song and prayer this evening. So well done. <laughs> Thank you.